Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode three, Greek mythology and the story of creation. At the end of the last episode, the Mycenaean Greek kingdom collapsed, and the land was invaded by the Dorians. The Dorians didn't read or write, and so the Greeks entered a 400-year dark age. When they finally adopted the Phoenician alphabet, the first thing the Greeks wrote down was their mythology. These stories were being passed down from generation to generation for hundreds of years. It would have been nice if we could talk more about the Dorian Age, but we think that sharing the stories the Dorians were telling each other is a good substitute. The Greek religion was filled with a pantheon of gods, and the most famous of them was Zeus. But Zeus was not the first god, nor the father of all gods. Greek mythology starts with the story of creation. That is the Greek version of the story of creation. In the beginning, there was nothing. No light, no life, no earth, no sun, no stars, no galaxies. There was nothing. Nothing but chaos. This nothingness might not have been anything physical, but it was full of energy. Energy and mass. It was just shapeless. This was the state of the universe before chaos gave birth to three different gods, Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros. Unlike the Olympian gods, Zeus, Athena, and Poseidon, these gods did not have human form. They were more infinite, everywhere, shapeless, but with natural form, even though they were still living gods. The first goddess was Gaia. She was the earth itself and represented the land and all of the creatures and plants that grew on her. Gaia was Mother Earth, and her body is what sustains life. She is the goddess of all things, natural and beautiful. The second god was Tartarus, and his domain was below the earth. This was the realm of the dead, and fire, and brimstone, where monsters and demons lived, and where the souls of the damned were taken and held prisoner. It was a violent, hot, and fiery realm that occasionally made its presence known when volcanoes erupted. Eris was the third god, and he was the god of love. Love was the most important realm, because love gives birth to creation. He is also known as Cupid in the Roman religion, and is generally depicted as an angel. These three gods lived harmoniously for a while before two more gods were birthed out of the chaos. These gods were Erebus and Nyx. Erebus was the god of shadows and deception, while Nyx was the goddess of night. These gods had more in common with each other as they both represented deep darkness, and so they mated together and gave birth to a new level of gods. The children of this dark union between Nyx and Erebus produced gods that brought sleep, dreams, old age and death, as well as the heavenly light and day. It seems the children of Nyx and Erebus were bringing the laws of nature into existence. Gaia, the Earth Mother, soon became pregnant, and soon she gave birth to three more gods. Her firstborn was Uranus, the sky, Pontus, the ocean, and the aureus, which represent the many, many mountains. Now there were enough gods to represent the physical world as we know it. But there was still no life, at least no life other than the gods. So Uranus and Gaia took to each other and created a new generation of gods. These gods were known as the Titans. There were 12 titans in total, but the unholy union between Gaia and her son Uranus, six monsters were born into the world. Among these monsters were the Cyclops. Uranus loved his hideous bastard children so little that he stuffed them back into his mother's womb. 
Because Gaia is the earth itself, it sounds more like he buried his children deep under a mountain. There the Titans remained locked up, and all without the consent of Gaia. In fact, the presence of these Titans being locked inside of Gaia's body caused her to feel a lot of pain and discomfort. When Gaia realized what was causing her so much pain, she became angry with Uranus. She needed to rescue her children from the prison in her womb, so she came up with a plan. A powerful sickle was created and given to one of the gods trapped inside of her womb. The only god brave enough to stand up to their father was Kronos. He took the sickle and waited inside of his mother's womb for Uranus to come back for some late night action. As soon as Uranus tried to have sex with Gaia, Kronos reached out with the sickle and cut off his father's genitals. Uranus backed off screaming and Kronos reached out of his mother's womb and cast Uranus's junk into the sea. Now you would think that this meant no more children for Uranus, but the blood from his wound landed on Gaia and spawned new creatures, including nymphs, giants, and furies. Now, I never knew what furies were before, but I assure you, they are not furries. You know, those people who dress up as stuffed animals. Finally, when Uranus's junk landed in the ocean, it conceived another goddess. This time, a more beautiful god arose out of the sea, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty. This marks the end of Uranus's reign on Earth, and after this, he left forever, but not before cursing his children specifically that of Kronos. His curse was that one day he too will be overthrown. And with that, Uranus left the earth. Now Kronos was the ruler of all the Titans, his brothers and sisters. There were originally 12 Titan gods, and Kronos was the ruler because it was he who defeated Uranus. But who were the other eleven gods? There was Oceanus, Coeus, Creus, Epitus, and Hyperion. Hyperion is the only god of the Titans I'd ever heard of before because he was played by Mickey Rourke in The Immortals. Cronos also had six Titan sisters, Thea, Rhea, Themis, Nemosine, Phoebe, and Tethys. Out of these gods, Phoebe is the most familiar because a character in Friends was named after her. This is just another long list of names, but each god had distinct qualifications that added to nature and reality as humans saw it. I said there were 12 original Titans, and if you're wondering how were there more later on, then know that many Titans had kids with each other, and the children of Titans were known as Titans as well. Hesiod wrote that the Titans were the old gods. Kronos was the god of time and the ages. Oceanus was obviously the ocean, or salt water in particular. Chaos was the god of intelligence and foresight and planning. Creus was the heavenly constellation. Iapetus was mortality itself. And Hyperion was Mickey Rourke. <laughs> just, just kidding. Hyperion was physical light. Tethys was a goddess of all fresh water on the earth. Phoebe was a goddess of prophecy. Nemesine was a goddess of memory and remembrance. Themis was a goddess of divine law and order. Thea was a goddess of all things shining, either the twinkling starlight, the light reflecting off water, or even the twinkling light of gold in the sun. Rhea was a goddess of fertility and motherhood. She also became the wife of Cronus and bore him several children. With twelve gods ruling over the world, everything seemed like it was going to be A-OK. -okay. After all, Uranus was gone. The Earth, Gaia, belonged to them now. The first race of mortal men of gold were created. They lived in unending spring and abundance. Having no women, they died off, becoming the holy spirits of the earth. In fact, Gaia was so thankful for the banishment of Uranus that she willfully produced enough food from her body for every living creature on earth. There was always enough fruit 
and grain and fish and meat for the humans to live happily and easily for many years to come. This was considered the golden age, and for this period of time the entire earth was like the Garden of Eden. Because everyone had everything they could ever want or desire, there was no crime or war or hatred of any kind. And everything would have been okay had Uranus not cursed Kronos before leaving for the skies. This curse really haunted Kronos. The fact that he knew his kids were going to rise up and overthrow him didn't stop him from having them. Instead of abstaining from sex altogether, he decided he would just kill the kids after conceiving them. Because of the curse laid upon him by his father Uranus, Kronos devoured his children as they were brought to him by his wife Rhea. If you look up pictures of Kronos, you will see him tearing chunks out of his babies as he eats them alive. But it sounds more like he just swallowed them whole. The first five babies were all eaten by the father Kronos, but Rhea was determined to save her sixth child. So she dressed a rock up in baby clothes and presented it to her husband, Kronos. Obviously, he never looked at the food or even chewed, and he swallowed the rock whole. Rhea hid her sixth child, whom she named Zeus, and had him sent to Crete, where he was raised by nymphs. Zeus was determined to save his five siblings, and so he devised a plan to pose as Cronus cupbearer and slipped him a drug that would force him to vomit as soon as he drank the wine. Cronus took the cup from Zeus and downed the entire glass, and suddenly he became very ill and vomited everything within his stomach. And just like that, out came Zeus' older brothers and sisters. This led to a violent upheaval as the gods battled it out over whose dominance. Of course, Zeus couldn't defeat the Titans on his own, but with the help of several titans who took his side, Zeus was finally able to defeat his father Cronus and the rest of the titans. Now you would think, oh good, Zeus just defeated the tyrant Cronus. Everything can return back to normal and the golden age can continue. Uh, this is not the case. The silver race of mortal men were created. After spending a century being cared for as babies, they offered no honor to the gods, and Zeus destroyed them. They became the spirits of Tartarus. Gaius was angry. The Titans were her children, and they were being attacked from all fronts. So she mated with her brother Tartarus, who was a god of the land below earth, Hell. And she spawned a horrible monster to defeat Zeus and his allies, and save her son Cronus. This monster had many heads, and brought fear among the gods, and scared most of them away. This monster also brought fear and death to the earth and ended the golden age. Zeus wasn't afraid and he used his power of thunder to destroy the monster and had him buried under Mount Etna in Sicily. Cronus was defeated and he was banished from earth to the underworld of Tartarus. But Zeus couldn't leave his father there forever and eventually freed him and sent him to rule over Elysium as king. Elysium was the kingdom of heaven. It is a magical kingdom like the earth during the golden age, with peace and love and plenty forever. This kingdom of heaven, Elysium, was only for the gods and demigods and heroes who earned their right to spend eternity in heaven. The bronze race of mortal men were created from the ash trees. They were warlike and soon killed themselves off. Zeus and the goddess who gave him the potion, which caused Kronos to vomit up his children, ended up hitting it off, and one night they made sweet love, and the goddess Metis became pregnant with Zeus's child. After she became pregnant with his child, Zeus heard a prophecy about his children, saying that his son would become so powerful he would overthrow his father. Now this had already happened with Kronos and Uranus, and then again with Zeus and Kronos, and now it was going to happen again. Zeus wasn't thrilled about this prophecy, so he did the only thing he could think of. He ate his pregnant wife whole. Now this never seemed to work in the past, and I don't know why Zeus thought it would work this time. So now Zeus's pregnant wife was inside of him, 
And while she was inside of Zeus, she gave birth to a daughter. Now this child grew inside of Zeus and worked her way to his head, where she caused him great migraines. The migraines became so great that eventually Zeus's skull started to crack. The pain became so intense that he cracked his head open and Athena burst from his skull, fully dressed and armed and ready for war. She was a beautiful warrior princess. And now Zeus was the dominant god on the scene. His first act as king of the gods was to lock up the titans, imprisoning them below the earth in the depths of Tartarus. Now Prometheus, however, never opposed Zeus in the battle between the Olympians and the Titans. So Zeus spared him the fate of his Titan family. One of the goddesses liberated from the belly of Kronos was Hera. She was an all-beautiful goddess and Zeus fell in love with her. He proposed a marriage union between Zeus and Hera, but she declined his offer. So Zeus turned to trickery. He turned himself into a cuckoo bird caused a terrible thunderstorm, and then perched himself outside of Hera's window. When she opened the door for the bird to come in and clutched the scared creature to her breast, Zeus transformed from the bird to his regular self and then raped Hera. It would seem Hera was too proud to admit she was tricked and agreed to marry Zeus afterwards. Zeus was now the ruler of the world, and Hera was his queen. Zeus went to Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus with the task of repopulating the earth after the devastating war of the gods. Prometheus and Epimetheus took all the creatures and gave them unique talents before turning them loose on the earth. Birds were given the ability to fly, the horses to gallop, and the fish to swim. All the creatures of the earth were created and let loose. And the last creature left, and the very end of a long day of creating life on earth, they came to the race of man. They carved them out of the clay, into the perfect shape, and were about to bestow upon them the best ability and gifts when they realized they were already used up. All their abilities and all the rest of the creatures of the earth. They were out of talons, wings, poisonous fangs, and even out of fur. They were out of time and out of abilities. And it was time to let their latest creation run loose on the earth. Prometheus really liked his creation and had envisioned it from the beginning. But without any cool abilities, his vision was nothing more than a bunch of smarter than your average monkeys running around the forest. This was really disappointing to Prometheus, as this was his crown and jewel. This was his vision, and it was such a disappointment. It couldn't stand up to a lion's claws, a bull's horn, or even the cold winter frost. He needed to do more. One night before the dawn, Prometheus took the fire from the sun, capturing its fire and power, and took it down to earth. When he bestowed the gift of fire among the humans, they revolved rapidly. They were no longer afraid of the dark and ran at the slightest sound. They were forming camps with big fires at night and scared the wild beasts away. They formed villages and were able to raise families without the fear of the lion or the bear. Very quickly, man grew stronger and braver, and they grew to dominate nature, even taming lesser species. These new humans were finally the creatures Prometheus was trying to create. He was finally happy. Prometheus finally showed his creation to Zeus. And at first, he was okay with everything. His only demand was for the humans to sacrifice to Zeus. Now the humans were told the conditions from Prometheus and they agreed. Of course they would sacrifice a bull to the god Zeus. I mean, he didn't create them, but he did create everything else. And he was the king of the gods. So the humans killed a bull, split it in half, And instead of dividing the bull up equally, they removed all of the delicious fat and the best cuts of the meat from the bull and then wrapped it in entrails and other gross parts of the animal. They then showed the two piles of bull to Zeus. And he looked at the pile of garbage and then at the pile of meat covered in the animal's skin and Zeus chose the bigger pile. 
The humans were excited. They tricked Zeus into choosing the larger pile when all of the best parts were wrapped in the garbage. But Zeus discovered the trickery from the humans and in a fit of rage, he cursed all of mankind and removed their gift of fire. Without the ability to make fire, the race of man regressed. They were forced to live their nights cold and afraid of the wild beasts. They had to eat their meat raw, and many people died. Before long, they reverted back to their wild state. Prometheus couldn't stand to see his creation suffer like this, so he defied Zeus and snuck more of this supernatural fire and gave it to mankind. With fire back in their hands, mankind started to pull themselves out of the darkness and get some sort of civilization back again. But the fires burning in the night caught Zeus's attention, and he went into a rage that terrified the gods. Prometheus warned his brother Epimetheus that Zeus was going to be so mad at Prometheus, Zeus was going to try and punish Epimetheus as well. Before Zeus apprehended Prometheus, he warned his brother not to accept any gifts from the gods, as it will most likely be a trick. Zeus sought out Prometheus, and when he found him, he sent him to the edge of the earth, in the Caucasus, and had him chained to the side of a mountain. And every day, an eagle flew out of the sky and pecked at his stomach, ripping through the flesh and devouring the liver. It was a most painful, horrible ordeal that left Prometheus screaming at the top of his lungs every day. And every night, because Prometheus was a titan, his liver grew back, only for the eagle to come back the very next day and do it all over again. Zeus came down and gave Prometheus one final chance and offered to free him, so long as Prometheus agreed to take the fire away from his creation. But Prometheus loved mankind and chose to sacrifice himself instead, dooming himself to centuries of torture as the eagle chewed his liver out of his stomach every day. Zeus was angry with Prometheus and plotted against his brother Epimetheus and his creation, the humans. He went to the god Hephaestus and ordered him to create a woman, the first woman of the human race. After working very hard on his new creation, Hephaestus showed his works to the gods. They fell in love with this beautiful creation and bestowed upon her many gifts. Her name was Pandora, and the gods gifted her with beauty, jewels, wisdom, and rhetoric. Zeus took Pandora and brought her to Epimetheus as a gift, but not before bestowing a small box to Pandora as a final gift. Zeus told Pandora that this special box was a gift for mankind and she was not to open it and look at the contents under any circumstances. When Pandora was presented to Epimetheus, her beauty captivated him, and he forgot the warning given to him by Prometheus not to accept a gift from the gods under any circumstance. Epimetheus gave Pandora a nice room to stay in his palace, and while she laid in her bed, she marveled at the beautiful box given to her by Zeus. She knew she was not to open it up, but based on the beauty and intricacies carved into the side of the box, and all the gold and jewels stitched into the side, she couldn't help but wonder what gift awaited inside. It must be something really spectacular. Late at night, she slowly opened the lid to peek inside. Unfortunately, the second the box opened, a sliver of immense pressure lift forced the lid off and black spiral of mist exploded out of Pandora's box. It turned into a black tornado and gave off no light. This darkness contained all the dark qualities of mankind that Prometheus kept hidden from his creation. Until now, mankind was pure and loving and happy. There was no greed or want or hatred or jealousy. But now that Pandora's box had been opened, these dark sinful qualities unleashed themselves upon the world, 
corrupting the souls of mankind. As the evil unleashed itself in the box, Pandora panicked and tried to close the box, but the pressure was too great, and it was impossible to seal the lid. Once the evil had escaped, Pandora looked inside the box and saw that it was empty, and although she could now close the lid, it was too late. The evil that was inside was out now, and there was no putting it back. When she looked close at the empty box, she realized there was one thing left at the bottom of the box. It was hope. And it was hope that escaped the box last, and it gave mankind the will and power to survive. Now that Pandora unleashed the evil and suffering upon mankind, Zeus could continue to punish a mankind forever. Over time, mankind populated the earth, and nature was replaced by the cruelness and greed of man. The world had become a place of suffering due to the violence of man. Knowing that the world was once a beautiful place where love and happiness once reigned, Zeus grew angry with mankind. And let's be honest, he always had it out for them. So one day, Zeus decided it was time to wipe the humans off the face of the earth. Zeus went to his brother Poseidon and told him it was time to cause a great flood and wash mankind from the earth. Poseidon stabbed his trident into the earth and water burst from the geysers in the ground. And water overflowed rivers and poured out of the mountains and rushed up from the sea. As the waves and rising tides flooded the farmland, the humans ran for the nearest hills, but the water kept rising. And the violent waves, crashing up against the hills, swept the humans away, drowning millions of people. The gods watched all of this unfold from the top of Mount Olympus. They watched as mountain after mountain vanished beneath the waves. And all of the humans died from the floods. One of the gods turned to Zeus as the last of the humans clung to the tops of the mountain. The god said to Zeus, Who is going to worship us once the humans are dead? Zeus stopped and pondered that for a moment. Hmm. The only reason he hated the humans so much was because of that time they tricked him into taking the cheap part of the sacrifice. If he killed every human, there would be no one left to worship him. Now this was a real tough decision for Zeus to make. But in the end, he raised his hand and called his brother Poseidon to relinquish the sea. When the ocean receded, there were only two humans left, and by some luck they were male and female. That was enough to repopulate the earth. And while the shell-shocked humans wandered from ruined town to ruined town, looking for some sign of life but clearly finding none, they turned to the gods and asked, how were they supposed to repopulate the world? You see, yeah, they were both male and female, but they were also very old and beyond any age that could bear children. So unless the gods intervened, they were going to go extinct. One of the marble statues of the gods came to life and told the two humans to wander the world and throw rocks over their shoulders. They would be casting the bones of Gaia herself over their shoulders. And once the rocks hit the earth, they would sink into the ground. And a small statue popped up in its place. The statues then sprung to life. And every stone thrown by the woman bore a female, and every rock by the man bore a male. And soon the old couple created enough people to successfully repopulate the earth. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. Stay safe and stay awesome.